yeah uh, we will be starting uh, this class so today we will be speaking on uh, basics of breast imaging today i'll try to cover sonomammography and uh, uh, mammography both conventional and digital together so welcome you all uh, again to today's session and i welcome you on behalf of the prayas let's stand together team so today it will be more of a lecture than uh, case discussions maybe we'll have a case discussion on this exclusively uh, in the next class but this time uh, i thought uh, we need to focus on the basics of how to do a breast imaging especially ultrasound and mammography and basic interpretation so it will be uh, a lecture class if any doubts please uh, message in the chat, chat box before we go on to the imaging per se we let's understand a little bit of uh, breast anatomy which is relevant for imaging uh, breast as we all know is a glandular tissue glandular organ uh, located in the in between the two layers of the superficial fascia the superficial and the deeper layer of superficial fascia in the chest and uh, uh, it's a glandular element so it will have uh, components like uh, ducts uh, here we call it lac which are dilated near the region uh, and they are called ampulla at that region and uh, this is the areolar region and this is the nipple where they open up and the smaller branches are actually called, uh, called uh, segmental ducts right then there are lobar ducts and finally the smallest of them are called lobular ducts so here uh, we can see in this particular square an image depicting the most basic unit of the breast tissue which is very relevant uh, in pathogenesis it is called uh, it consists of a lobule which is basically glandular epithelium acini where the secretion takes place and a duct which leads into it which is called extra lobular terminal duct so there is a lobule which consists of glandular elements and there is a duct which leads into each lobule it is called extra lobular terminal duct so both of these lobule and the extra lobular terminal duct together are called something called tdlu terminal ductal lobular unit why this is important is this is the place where most of the pathologies of the breast occur and this is where most of the pathologies of the breast take place especially the junction of the extra lobular terminal duct with the lobule is the most common site for uh, ductal malignancies okay ductal carcinoma so this is very relevant can we see these on imaging we'll come to that in the further slides and then uh, this is the breast parenchyma okay the superficial layer of the superficial fascia the deep layer and there is the skin right nipple areola complex remember the skin thickness of anything more than 2 to 3 mm thick is uh, abnormal it can happen in malignancy it can happen in any condition which can cause edema and then there is a layer just posterior to the breast parenchyma which is usually some connective tissue which is called the retromammary retromammary zone and then there is the prepectoral fascia what could this abnormality be lymph node accessory breast yeah that's correct so just uh, see and compare it with the breast parenchyma here right so this tissue is very similar to this and this is the commonest location of accessory breast tissue so that is the reason uh, we had to image axilla either for accessory breast tissue or for lymph nodes okay because that is the commonest site for accessory breast so different imaging modalities available for breast mammography and ultrasonography are the ones that we most often end up doing ductography uh, not commonly done these days uh, it's injecting uh, contrapositive iodinated contrast into the ducts and uh, see in especially when a patient presents with an, a bloody nipple discharge in suspected cases of a ductal papilloma so and even a fibrocystic breast disease but it is invasive so it is routinely not done these days and then thermal imaging of breast thermal imaging came up in a big way but uh, not has not picked up it's not as been it has not been so sensitive enough to pick up the malignancies 
the newest addition is DBT, the digital breast stoma synthesis, also called the CD scan of the breast. So I request, uh, so that's, that's one more thing. And uh, MRI and CT scans. So MRI has its own uh, role and to play in the imaging of breast tissue, CT scans also. Nuclear medicine and PET, definitely they have, especially in unknown uh, secondaries elsewhere, they can be used. And also for metastatic screening, they, they can be used. So why do we image? First is to detect if there is an abnormality and if there is an abnormality to categorize it as benign or malignant. Okay, so basic concept of doing most of the breast imaging uh, in the present day is to detect early malignancy, okay? So, so this detection of early cancers can be in the form of primary screening, secondary screening, and uh, imaging is also used in some specific conditions to diagnose even benign uh, lesions like maybe a breast abscess, fibroadenomas, galactoseals, and definitely imaging helps in guiding interventions. So these are the another. So let's start with ultrasound. So what are the indications of ultrasound of the breast? The first thing is ultrasound is the most sensitive imaging modality to detect cystic lesions, okay? So cystic lesions, we can be 100% sure on ultrasound that it's a pure cyst. So that is the most important advantage of ultrasound. However, in detection of early malignancies, ultrasound does, has not been found to be as sensitive alone or even as sensitive as mammography. Why? Because most of the early suspicious lesions are, uh, are in the form of either microcalcifications, very small masses, or uh, uh, architectural distortion, which are not a, which we which we cannot pick up on ultrasound. So that is the reason. Uh, so and uh, one more thing is an ultrasound, the glandular parenchyma it appears hypoechoic. So most of the times we end up missing some of the genuine lesions because most of the lesions also appear hypoechoic on ultrasound. So the other indication of ultrasound is to evaluate whenever we find a dense glandular breasts on mammography. So that is another indication for uh, mammography, sorry, uh, sona mammography. So with addition of ultrasound to mammography, the sensitivity of picking up an early malignancy crosses almost 90. So ultrasound plays a vital role along with mammography, not alone. And uh, to evaluate any palpable masses in pregnant and lactating women where the mammography is uh, not feasible, and especially in uh, women less than 30 years of age, the primary modality of even the screening purposes uh, for any lesion is ultrasound. So ultrasound is an important ad adjunct to mammography. Yeah, uh, I, have get, I have been getting some messages that uh, we are not audible. Am I audible now? Am I audible? Yeah, thank you. I think there are some issues uh, with some people. Please check your settings, okay? So, and I request the others, you can just type the message on my behalf uh, just to help them out because uh, I alone will not be able to do all the things together. So, uh, and kindly from next time onwards, just go through some settings, okay, which are required uh, before joining in. That will be a great help. So, ultrasonography is an important adjunct to mammography, correct? because it increases sensitivity of picking up malignancies early at the earlier stage. But the problem is uh, ultrasonography is uh, it's individual dependent, okay? The expertise, it requires a lot of expertise, but it's widely available, cheap of cost, radiation free, all that stuff. Important things to know about sonomammography is that we use a frequency, uh, whereas uh, that of for peripheral dopplers and all the focusing distance will be in the range of three to four centimeters. So 
because uh, the general uh, breast parenchyma is at this particular depth around 1.5 to 2 centimeters but however we can adjust the focus depending on the size of the tissue but this is this is the optimal depth of focus okay so very important if it is not at 1.5 to 2 centimeters kindly adjust your focus okay on the scanning machine and uh, as far as possible keep it a single focus so obviously you can increase the number of focal points on ultrasound scan if you have seen so as far as possible keep it to a single focus to have the best resolution at a depth of around two centimeters and how to scan how to scan now, there are many ways uh, actually when we were students none of us actually uh, we had not read about the exact types of scans though we had learned it most of it from our teachers and many of these things are not given in many of the books so it is very advisable to know how to scan there are different types of methods of scanning so i'll come to that in the next slide okay so that is very important and if we find any lesion on an ultrasound we have to note down which clock position it is taking the nipple as the center and we have to and uh, we have to measure the distance of the lesion from the nipple and what is the orientation of transducer when you are actually taking that image is it a longitudinal orientation radial transverse anti-radial i'll just discuss in the next few slides the most important thing in sonomammography is palpate the area of interest and try to see what is the cause for that mass like uh, feeling that she has so this is what is called positive for an explanation even there may not be any particular lesion there but there may be like more parenchymal glandular elements in that particular area so we have to ideally uh, document in the report so that uh, we can tell the uh, referring doctor or the even the patient that there is no cause for concern and this uh, mass is just uh, increased number of glandular tissue so this is very important this is called as positive for an explanation so palpate as you scan very important and it also adds a clinical dimension to the radiologists so this picture is depicting the position positioning for the sonomammography so the patient is in supine position on the table examination table what is important is here a few things uh, that we should understand is the breast that has to be examined it will be clear obviously it has to be elevated a little bit so that to support the breast so that it doesn't fall off with the wedge shaped uh, thing and most of the times use a pillow underneath the shoulder the shoulder is extended and abducted over the head and positioned like this most important is ensure that there is the patient the, the part is adequately exposed including the axilla okay so some uh, ladies may be hesitant in it but you have to convince them that it is required otherwise we may miss uh, many things okay it's very important positioning okay this is very important to know so yeah this is how how do we scan so there are many various methods of scanning this is called grid scanning pattern this is like the transducer is oriented transversely here okay and this is the top and this is the bottom so the transducer you scan from top to bottom in one line and then just go more medially towards the nipple then scan from below to upwards then at the level of nipple again scan down scan up so this is longitudinal scanning with the transverse orientation of the probe this is very important okay and similarly after this type of scanning we do transverse scanning with the longitudinal orientation of the probe again in a grid pattern from right to left again from left to right right to left left to right not to miss out on any area of the breast so it is very important okay this is called grid type of scanning pattern both types we have to do this is another type of scanning called radial scanning where the orientation of the probe change i mean it has to be just uh, rotated in a uh, revolved in a circular fashion 
from close to the nipple one circle then just further beyond that the second circle and then further beyond that the third circle so this is what is called radial scan so the probe is oriented almost tangentially to the uh, nipple in this so then there is something called anti radial scanning so in this anti radial scanning the it is very similar to the first one the scanning procedure but the orientation of the probe is perpendicular or it is more parallel to the nipple rather than perpendicular okay so it is parallel to the nipple so this is called anti radial scan planing scanning so this all this is actually found more relevant in breast scanning most of them do this radial and anti radial techniques but uh, we have to remember there is something called grid scanning pattern which also may be equally affect layer will consists of the glandular elements which will appear more hypoechoic and the fibrous stroma which will be hyperechoic and again the same image here we can see that this is the glandular tissue the subcutaneous zone or the pre mammary area and this one is the anterior mammary fascia the superficial layer of superficial fascia the retromammillary fascia and the retromammary zone this is the pectoralis muscle so this image is to depict uh, so th th there are dense breasts on mammography so dense breast on mammography can be two things okay one is dense glandular element which will be hypoechoic on ultrasound and dense fibrous stroma which will be hyperechoic on ultrasound so this is very important to know so it can be both the things it can be dense glandular element dense fibrous element and so doing a sonography on a dense breast on mammography is very important so as age progresses there will be more of fatty proliferation instead of glandular and fibrous stroma so we will have uh, the receding glandular sign so there are the, this is the glandular and the fibrous stromal element which is receding and we can see very prominent echogenic strands passing anterior to posterior these are the cooper's ligaments which uh actually support the breast parenchyma so what is this we were talking about terminal ducto ducto lobular units so on ultrasound we commonly see these elements hypoechoic right so these are the ducto lobular units terminal ducto lobular units that we are talking about the terminal ducto lobular units will have various appearances depending on the patient and it varies from patient to patient here we see very few of them most of fibrous stroma here there is lot of fibrous stroma and very small hypoechoic areas which are the ducto and here they are very prominent tdlus here we, we see that there are none at all on ultrasonography while reporting also we can divide the breast into three parts the anterior middle and posterior while reporting the lesion we have to measure the distance from the nipple and the o'clock position so we can measure we can say that the lesion is in the posterior part and measuring 4 cm from the nipple at 4 o'clock position and the orientation of the transducer when you are actually seeing the lesion so here is an example of a cyst i told you ultrasound is the most specific for a benign cystic lesion so anything that is very dark anechoic see this thing okay this is very important this a thin echogenic line periphery okay lining is very sensitive for a benign lesion a thin echogenic line okay and obviously posterior acoustic enhancement is again more sensitive towards a benign lesion so some suspicious sonographic findings and their correlates on mammography so speculations we can see on both and uh, speculations occur when there is a because of fibrous proliferation and uh, some desmoplasia around the malignant mass and this speculation will actually appear as a thick echogenic halo in the previous we saw a thin echogenic rim if, but it if it is thick irregular echogenic halo around the mass it is more in favor of a malignancy so mammography on uh, mammography it can be irregular poorly defined margins so what what we need to understand is an on sonography ductal extension of a mass can be seen which is not possible on mammography and uh, we can make out um, taller than wider shape taller means it is more the dimension is more on a ap uh, than on a transverse or a longitudinal acoustic shadowing and hypoechogenesis in ultrasound are also in favor of malignancy masses so just for example a benign mass 
usually would be round or oval with a well-defined wall and a thin echogenic rim and distal enhancement. This is a fibroadenoma. And malignancy, very irregular, maybe very indistinct at times, poorly defined walls and distal shadowing. So taller than wider, I told you what it is. The AP dimension will be more than transverse or longitudinal. And again, we can see a thick, shabby, echogenic rim indicating desmoplasia. Microlobulations are small lobulations that at least three of the, uh, if there are three or more lobulations within one or two centimeters of the lesion, so that indicates microlobulations in favor of malignancy, a thick echogenic border again, and intraductal extension of the mass. These are all in favor of malignancy. Color Doppler has its own role, and uh, own role, but uh, very minimal in fact. So all the mal malignant masses have definitely have increased vascularity, and uh, most of them show low resistance flow. So coming to mammography, so this was a brief about ultrasound. We'll again uh, catch it uh, over after the mammography part. So how is mammography different from a conventional X-ray tube? So in mammography, the most important is the focal spot size. We need high resolution. So the focal spot size is very small in the range of 0.2 to 0.5 millimeters. In the conventional X-ray tube, it can be one more than one millimeters even in a ct scan it varies right 16 slice and all that we use it can be 0 0.7 0 0.8 millimeters so in mammography it is a very small focal spot size and the target filtration filter combination the molybdenum most of the times it is rhodium tungsten and uh, filters are all again of molybdenum or rhodium and there is a grid htc grid which is used in mammography, high transmission cellular grids. The source to image receptor distance is around 55 centimeters, whereas in a conventional X-ray, any other part, it is around 100 centimeters. And we use a compression plate here. Why do we do compression? We'll just talk in the next slide. Before that, a little bit on screening mammography. When do we do screening? So there are many thoughts about this, many guidelines issued varying. One says it is start from 40 years, the other one says start from 50 years, but we generally tend to follow ACR being radiologists. So they say more than 40 years, we have to do a screening mammography annually. And every monthly uh, self test examination and annual physical or a clinical examination is more than sufficient. But if there is a family history or a first degree relative history of breast cancer, start screening mammography 10 years prior prior to when the lesion was detected in the relative okay if it is the the lady had a breast malignancy at 42 years detected then start screening at least from 32 years onwards annually for the uh, the first degree relative so that and uh, and generally not less than 30 years so so any any lady more than 30 years with the first relative of breast cancer can undergo a uh, screening mammography not less than 30 years there are many other guidelines for this some the obstetric gynecology society tells that uh, above 50 years is the uh, guideline for screening and uh, uh, up to 30 years, just a self test examination and annual physical examination. But uh, I think we should follow the American College of Radiology till we have some established norms in our country. So why do we do breast compression? The compression is generally we do to reduce the geometric unsharpness, to improve the contrast, to diminish any possible motion, to reduce the radiation dose. How do we do it? By actually reducing the thickness of the breast, to, to making the the breast of uniform thickness and also reducing the overall thickness of the breast by doing compression and to so to more accurate assessment of the density of the mass and to separate the superimposed breast tissue wherever there is a mass uh, the breast tissue in, uh, anterior posterior to it uh, if we on compression will be spread out and uh, we can image the mass better so different positions that we use the most common are the craniocaudal and the medial lateral oblique view. So this is how we do a craniocaudal view. Very important. This is the compression paddle, right? This is the base where uh, the target is here, the film, uh, the cassette, and uh, this uh, 
the breast is positioned like this so you have to elevate this platform to adequate level so that it supports uh, breast adequately in a horizontal position and when you when you are positioning the most important is uh, we have to try and include we have to drag the breast onto the target like it is being done here and support it while the compression paddle is being applied so this is how a craniocaudal view is done and uh, is, uh, has the film come correctly we'll just assess how to assess the quality of the image that we have got and the second one is media lateral oblique view so the mammography machine is tilted at an angle of 30 to 60 degrees any anywhere between 30 to 60 degrees right whatever is comfortable for the patient and the breast is positioned in this manner right and uh, the hand the ipsilateral hand is actually supported with the uh, and it is held uh, she has to hold the handle on that part and uh, again try to pull the breast tissue uh, forward so that you include the inframammary fold very important okay here also we have to include the inframammary fold and here also we have to include the inframammary fold so if anyone asks you what is the angle for uh, medial lateral oblique it is 30 to 60 degrees so this is how we get the images cranial caudal and medial lateral oblique additional views there are many views that can be done but uh, generally not done the first two are adequate and if required we end up doing either a spot compression or a magnification views which are helpful so this is what is spot compression in the previous one we saw the compression panel is pretty large so it compresses the entire breast tissue but here the, the smaller compression plate is applied wherever we see a mass lesion on the initial two images on cc and mlo we just apply a smaller compression plate to displace the breast tissue above and below the mass lesion so that we can image it better so this is spot compression plates spot compression views and um, these this is what is called magnification views so here what we do is we increase the object to receptor distance okay once this is increased the image is magnified it's as simple as that so here the breast tissue is very close to the cassette and here the breast tissue is away from the cassette there is an increased object to film or a, a film distance so how is it done by using a platform called magnification platform so the more the distance the more is the magnification so the magnifications of up to 1.5 or two times can be applied by just using such platforms which is available which which the vendor gives you when you purchase a mammography machine so magnification mammography again a smaller focal spot size is used than the uh, then the mammography itself here we use 1.1 to 0.15 the distance between the breast and the film is increased the image is enlarged and more sharp and accurate information regarding micro calcifications and masses is seen in this the dose is however higher so this is an example of magnification mammography here we see some architectural distortion we are not sure this is a conventional cranial caudal view and this is a magnification view where we can see a speculated appearance and the calcification also so this is how a magnification appears again another example of a magnification view many calcifications are there but we want to see the, what what are the types of calcification so we do a mag view and here we see all our peripherally dense and centrally more loosened type of calcifications which are in favor of benign calcifications these are all oil cysts or a fat necrosis areas so again mammography has its disadvantage especially in young breasts which have more glandular element and also in lactating breasts so generally uh, ultrasound is supplemented in such cases so this is an image showing how to assess the adequacy of the image that we have uh, taken so how is it done on a first starting with cranial caudal view and uh, so if if the, it's a good image then you will be able to see the pectoralis muscle like this convex and you will be able to see the cleavage clearly and then you will be able to see the nipple which is in profile okay 
and the lateral glandular tissue is also included. Most of the times when we actually don't give uh, adequate traction, this part, this part may be missed and even this tissue will not be seen, the pectoralis muscle. And on this image, just check what is something called posterior nipple line, which is the line, the tangential line drawn from the nipple to the mid part of the pectoralis. And how to assess for the adequacy on our medial lateral oblique is we have to see pectoralis muscle at least till the half of the breast here, right? And this line, the, nip, uh, the posterior nipple line should be perpendicular to the orientation of the pectoralis. And again, here we have to see, we should be able to see the inframammary fold clearly. So this is, these three things, if we can see, it's a good uh, medial lateral oblique view. So how to report? This is available on, in the ACR website on a radiology assistant article. So I'm just going to rush through this in brief. Please read, this is very important to maintain the standard uh, pattern of reporting all over the world. So the first thing that you have to write in your reporting is the indication. So why are we doing this? It's screening, diagnostic, follow-up. And second one is the breast composition, A, B, C, D, different types. We'll talk about it. And what any findings like mass, asymmetry, architectural distortion, calcifications, and other associated features. And if there are any previous studies, just comparison. Uh, has it increased, decreased, resolved? And then give an assessment category. What are the recommendations? And that is how it is done. So these are the headings that we have to use in our reports. So if there is any mass lesion, so what are the things that we have to describe regarding the mass on a mammography? So there are some standard terminologies that we have to use. These are called descriptors or lexicons. So all over the world, we have to try and use the same terminologies. It has like can, a lesion can be either round in shape, oval in shape, or irregular in shape. There is nothing square or rectangle that we have to use. If it doesn't follow in, uh, into the round and oval category, it is irregular. So that is how it has to be done. Similarly, the margin of the mass circumscribed, okay? Instead of telling well delineated, stick to this terminology. Circumscribe, obscured when part of the mass, you are not able to see the uh, part of the uh, margin. Microlobulated, as I told you, small lobules, okay? Indistinct when most of the margins are not seen clearly. Speculated when there are sharp, angulated, linear, uh, hyperdense areas around the mass. So these are only the five descriptors for margins, three descriptors for shape of the mass. This is taken from radiology assistant. So everyone, please look into it. Density can be three types. Now the fourth has been added. So it has to be compared with the glandular parenchyma. So the, if it is fibroglandular stroma, if it is the mass is of the same density, it is equal. If it is less, it is low. If it is even lesser, it is called fat nowadays. And if it is high, it is high. Higher density lesions are uh, can be more malignant. And that was about the mass. Apart from the margin, shape, correct? Density, we have to tell the location that we already described at what o'clock position, and at least on a mammography, which quadrant is it? Okay, what is the distance from the nipple? So these things that we, ha we have to tell. And uh, then this is a slide regarding the types of calcifications after the mass, if there are any calcifications, how to report it. So these are different types of benign calcifications that we come across whenever there are calcifications in the skin, which are usually rounded, right? May have a central lucency. So these are skin calcifications and rod-like, long, linear, thick calcifications like this in mastitis, dystrophic, a lot, chunky calcifications, a popcorn-like calcification, a lobulated, uh, coarse, dense, large calcifications overlying a well-defined lesion seen in fibroadenoma, rim calcifications, peripheral calcifications, right? And vascular calcification will appear as tram track, two linear uh, calcifications with central lucency, maybe discontinuous, round calcification that we are seeing here, punctate, small, round calcifications. So these are all benign calcifications. 
so what are suspicious or likely to be malignant calcifications amorphous amorphous means powdery so it's like a talcum powder when you spread a talcum powder so that is how very small uh, indistinct almost indistinct margins so such calcifications are amorphous calcifications but uh, amorphous are more likely to be uh, malignant than benign. Remember this. Pleomorphic is varying sizes and shapes of any calcifications less than 5 millimeters. 0.5 millimeters, sorry, 0.5 millimeters. Any calcifications less than 1 millimeter should be considered as a micro calcifications. And of that, if it is less than 0.5 millimeters, it's a suspicious. Uh, micro calcification so it is more in favor of malignancy this is the only uh, coarse calcifications which can be more than 0.5 millimeters and still be malignant okay uh, fine linear so they are following a ductal pattern here linear branching they're all in uh, ductal carcinoma ductal carcinoma in situ this is fine linear branching is the most uh, um, malignant type of calcification fine linear and fine linear branching so when we see calcifications, we have to again tell what is the pattern of distribution of many uh, of those calcifications. If there are many diffuse, likely to be benign. Regional, if it is, if the calcifications are within two centimeters of the breast tissue. Grouped, previously known as known as clusters. If there are more uh, five or more micro calcifications in an area of two centimeters. Segmental, if they conform to a segment of the breast parenchyma. So these are the lexicons that we have to use while uh, describing. So first to start with types of breast composition, the types of breast composition can be four types, right? One is scattered areas. Uh, the first one is almost entirely fatty. So there's the most, uh, the mammography is most sensitive uh, in such uh, breast parenchyma. So for picking up malignancies, the second one is scattered areas of fibroglandular density. If there are areas of uh, dense strands, linear strands sort of a thing, right? Uh, they are more dense areas than the glandular parenchyma. And uh, they are unlikely to obscure any mass lesion underneath. So then only we call it scattered areas of fibroglandular density. Heterogeneously dense when they can obscure a mass. Okay, so that is a differentiation. Initially, it used to be percentages of the uh, dense areas. Now the percentage criteria is not followed. And the D is extremely dense. And in these cases, we have to do an ultrasound. Mass, we already discussed this. There is something called asymmetry. Asymmetry is which is uh, in comparison with the opposite breast, actually, asymmetry. Okay, so on we have to compare both the breast mammographies and any any small area which is which is not there in the other breast is considered as asymmetry. So focal asymmetry is seen in only one view, the other view it doesn't show any asymmetry, that is focal asymmetry, right? So there, uh, it is more likely to be benign. Then there are other types of asymmetry, like global asymmetry, when, when, which is uh, our regional asymmetry, which are seen in both the views, the medial lateral oblique and the craniocaudal view. In both, we can see that there is some asymmetry in the form of increased glandular elements or, or, or fibrous stroma. So they need to be looked at with suspicion, especially uh, regional asymmetry. Architectural distortion is when the lines which are uh, acutely angled or speculated in the absence of a mass. If there is a mass and there are speculations around it, even that is architectural distortion caused by a mass. But if there is absent mass and there are still some acutely angled or abnormal uh, radiating uh, lines or speculations, that is what is called architectural distortion. And especially if there are micro calcifications within, it definitely requires a stereotactic biopsy. And calcifications, we have already discussed. And then any associated features like skin retraction, skin thickening, sorry, skin thickening, anything more than two millimeters thickness, nipple retractions, skin trabecular thickening, axillary lymphadenopathy. So these are the things that we have to see. 
Then ultrasound also there are lexicons and ACR virates. So breast composition can be of three types: homogeneously fat and homogeneously fibroglandular, heterogeneous. So three types. So on mammography it was four types, on ultrasound it was three types: homogeneously fat, homogeneous fibroglandular, and heterogeneous. Shape, margins, they're all almost the same. Orientation, yeah, orientation is the probe orientation. Uh, orientation in relation to the probe. Parallel, not parallel. So we have to also always mention what was the orientation of the probe also when we were actually evaluating the mass. Echo pattern can be all of these types. Posterior features, acoustic enhancement or shadowing. Calcifications if seen and associated features and including Doppler we have to comment on. And uh, there's an elastography also which we'll try and discuss in the next class. So these are the things that we have to see. So we have already discussed this, typically benign calcification, suspicious morphology or of these types, easy to remember because of only five, of, uh, five types, amorphous, coarse, heterogeneous, fine pleomorphic, fine linear, fine linear branching, which are the most uh, suspicious ones. So an image of on a mammography depicting a circumscribed oval, okay? equal dense lesion okay equal dense to the glandular parenchyma so no calcifications at all so on ultrasound this was a fibroadenoma so examples of benign scattered calcifications and very round in shape large calcifications here here there are some vascular cramp tract type of calcifications and ductal calcifications so skin calcifications, as I said, peripherally, they'll be more dense, centrally, they'll be more lucent, very similar to the oil cysts. And this is a fibroadenoma with calcifications, also called popcorn type of calcifications seen in the involuting fibroadenoma, which is absolutely benign. Just an example of seal, not so well-defined lesion, was looking more of malignant because of speculations, but an ultrasound turned out to be a collection and lactic team mother, it was a galactosine. So another benign appearing lesion and ultrasound showing a thin echogenic rim and echo, anechoic uh, lesion this is with a posteroacoustic enhancement assist. So mammographic features of malignant masses, how do they appear on mammography? So some clues, these are some of the clues that we can just see. So the mass should be at least seen in two projections. So both the projections should, should be seen to call it a mass, otherwise it will be just an asymmetry. So indirect signs of malignancy can be focal architectural distortion, tenting of parenchyma, focal skin thickening, a solitary duct dilatation, in case, uh, especially in, on ultrasound, and lymph nodes. Lymph nodes, we have to see, look for the hilar pattern, very important. So this is showing a mass lesion with a cluster of calcifications here, speculated margins and nipple retraction. So this is a virus spy lesion. Here we are seeing a skin thickening with an underlying mass. Skin thickening can also occur in other conditions wherever there is a edema. Pleomorphic calcifications are again suspicious. And in this case, there was a mass with speculated margins. And so the final assessment categories are these zero, where uh, you cannot report, give a conclusive report. You need additional imaging, especially if you have done only ultrasound. And uh, inconclusive without a mammography, then you will give it as zero. But generally, tend to avoid this. Only give this when uh, you require you have you. Uh, you need a additional imaging or prior examinations. One is negative, where there are no abnormal findings at all. So then we give one. Two is benign, so there is no risk again. Uh, what is important is uh, many of the findings like benign. If we give uh, Bayrat three, even if there is a focal uh, large calcification, which may be an oil cyst. Actually, if you can. Uh, ignore the lesion you may actually downgrade it to one also so there is no problem with that so two is optional 
uh, in such cases okay uh, small uh, solitary calcification or diffuse uh, increase in uh, uh, bilateral breast uh, parenchymal density which an ultrasound was normal so all this can be just one and in three we we call it something called probably benign where the risk of malignancy is less than two the tendency is to give most of the lesions as three because it only suggests follow -up. Uh, better avoid three as much as possible. So this is the dictum. Okay, avoid three, especially if a lesion is palpable. It cannot be three. We have to either downgrade it to two or upgrade it to four. Remember this. Okay, so uh, by rats three, try and avoid as much as possible. If it is palpable, it cannot be three. Only an ill uh, which is not palpable can be assigned three based on its appearance. Four suspicious lesions so there's an increased risk of malignancy and requires a core biopsy okay so important is biopsy to go for a biopsy rather than an fnac in all such cases and it's again divided into three types 4a 4b and 4c so low suspicion moderate suspicion high suspicion i already told any fine linear linear branching type of calcifications or mass with the speculations right so these are all Four C types of lesions, and five is highly suggestive of malignancy, which is ninety-five percent malignant, and again it requires a tissue diagnosis. Six is, which is already biopsy proven and when clinically appropriate, uh, I mean, so surgical excision is done if there is any remnant, so we can apply the six immediate post-op or biopsy proven mass. So we already know that it's a malignancy rather than going for an end. Any descriptors you can directly label it as six. So this was about a brief on sonomammography and 